Yeah, basically, we just send the Copernicus DataSpace ecosystem homepage uh, and the Cubes and Clouds GitHub repo. So I would like you to register uh, for the Copernicus DataSpace ecosystem. And I will also do it with you together. It's pretty simple. So if you press login here, then this page will appear. You can press register and type in your data. I already have an account, but I will create another one just for testing if the system works correctly. Is your point to start the Israeli and test when profiling? Have a user research and search purpose research except we just what's wrong oh man um use suggest one password yes no Mm -hmm. Ah, it's a verse here. The app. No, phone, phone, right? It's the German keyboard. <laughs> Yes, I made it. Now I have to confirm my email. Did you manage to register? Someone has problems? In case, I mean, we are not managing Copernicus data space, so we can't do much. <laughs> okay, I confirm my email. And... And login. Okay. No, but they're ready. Ah, uh, I can. Okay, sorry, I didn't confirm my email. last time. I'm a, probably I'm already logged in. Okay. Okay, I'm logged in and uh, please go to analyze data and Jupyter Notebooks. And then you have to press access Jupyter Notebooks and then I think that a medium server will be enough. Then you press start. Oh, but why I'm registered with your account now? Well, doesn't matter. Let's see if we manage to crash their system <laughs> with everyone starting their own Jupyter Hub. Okay, maybe while we're waiting, I can um, explain to you what we're going to do. Um, so we're using a notebook that we've created for the online course, uh, Cubes in Clouds, that will start soon. So that is one part of the exercises we're doing there. And it is what we will do, we're going to request data from OpenEO, slice and dice a data cube to spatial and temporal um, extents that we're interested in. Then we're going to calculate um, an index, in this case, the normalized difference snow index. 
we're going to apply um, a thresholding method um, to distinguish snow from non-snow. And then we're going to do some aggregations based on these um, binary masks and going to aggregate that into a catchment. And then we will see how the snow cover um, is evolving um, throughout the year in a catchment. And we will compare that to some runoff data in the end. So it is a simple workflow, but it includes a lot of um, processes that you probably um, are looking forward to use in some of your workflows. And yeah, it's... Yeah, I now you should start. see if you manage to, to run, uh, to start the Jupyter Hub instance, you should see this this page. If you are used to Jupyter, you already know what you're seeing. But basically on the left side, we have like uh, our storage uh, with the, the files that we can navigate around. Uh, here we already have the uh, Cubes and Clouds repo, but we're gonna clone it again together. So Mattermost, uh, the second link that I sent, is the uh, link for cloning the beta repo. So we can open up a terminal here on the other terminal and we can clone the repo easily. Hit clone and link. And the, the folder will appear here on the left side. So if you navigate to the cubes and clouds folder, so you just open it then into lectures, then 3.1 data processing, exercises, and then please open the notebook called data processing CDSC. And now let's wait for everyone. Uh, let us know if you're stuck somewhere, if it did work. So in the predefined uh, Python environment that uh, Copernicus Data Space is offering, there are some missing libraries. Um, it's funny because, I mean, they offer you this environment to, to use OpenEO as well, but there's OpenEO, which is not installed. So we have uh, to install some missing libraries in the first cell. Uh, you can just run it. Uh, for running a Jupyter cell, you can either press the play button here or uh, with control enter and it will run. So after the installation will be ready to go. So basically, um, in order to use OpenEO in Python, you just have to install um, the OpenEO package, which you can use uh, install via via pip. Uh, but of course, here we are importing other libraries that we'll use later on for the final vis visualization and uh, uh, data cleaning and processing of the data. So the first step. Uh, when you interact with uh, an OpenEO backend uh, is to connect to it. So usually you have an URL, which can be uh, the one offered by Copernicus. It could be the one offered by OpenEO platform. Even here at URAC, we have our uh, OpenEO backend. But the way to connect to the actual backend, it doesn't, doesn't change. Um, for connecting to the backend, you don't require any authentication because there are some um, parts of the API that are public. So you can um, discover the collections that are available on the, the backend, the, the processes. Uh, but later on, if you want to actually uh, process some data and download some data, you need uh, an account. So in the next step, we're gonna authenticate. So perform the, the login step. Oh, sorry. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Uh, sure. Let me try. Okay. So in order to authenticate in this case, we are in the Python environment. You have to click. I mean, after that you run the cell, you have to click here. Uh, 
uh, there will be a page opening up and you have to grant the access to your data. You press yes, then you go back and write, uh, running the, the next cell, you'll see that uh, the account that, uh, yeah, I mean, you'll see your details, basically name, surname, email address. So this is just to verify that we actually logged in and our account worked. The next step, we're going to use um, a logical catchment uh, polygon that has been uh, defined previously. Uh, it's a GeoJSON file, which is under data here. It's called catchment outline GeoJSON. We're going to load it using GeoPandas and visualize it on the map. It's uh, so currently just to show you where we are, we are here in Bolzano and this catchment is above the city of Milano at the, which is uh, before the Valvenosta Valley. Uh, until, where do we go? Don't remember where we should, we should stop. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, with the connection L uh, object that we basically define here, connecting to OpenEO, so this con, we can um, get some information out of the backend. We can list the data collections that are available in uh, in this way. You could also do it in a more, let's say, um, nice way doing list collections and an interactive list uh, where you can also inspect the metadata of the collection will open up. All good? Yeah, okay. Now we are interested in the Sentinel True Level 2A collection, uh, which is called Sentinel True underscore Level 2A. And with the described collection, we can get uh, the detailed metadata about the collection. You can get description, previews, uh, temporary extent, all. Basically, this kind of information is uh, a rendered version of the stack metadata that uh, is basically um, offered via the opinion collection endpoint. Okay, so now we mm, discovered the data which is present. We decided what we're going to use, and we can actually start to build our uh, OpenEO process graph. Uh, in OpenEO, we define the workflows as process graphs, which are basically uh, JSON text descriptors of what we're going to do uh, in our workflow. And uh, they will describe all the steps that are required from loading the data until uh, storing the result. So we'll uh, extract the, the, the bounds of the error that we are interested in. As a time range, we're gonna use, uh, we will focus on the snow melting season of 2018. So from February to June, 2018. Um, and we're gonna use the green sphere and sync classification bands from, yeah, from Sentinel-2. Additionally, if you would like to filter also directly uh, the cloud cover, you could also use the properties uh, filter and directly filtering uh, the data with a cloud cover less than equal a value that you could decide. And uh, now uh, we reach a step where we have defined all our parameters and we create the first uh, the first building block of our open your process graph, which can also be rendered and it looks like this. We have a load collection uh, process with the bands that we define, spatial extent, temporal extent, and so on. Here you can even inspect what you passed as parameters. And now we'll do the same with R, so also the R users can follow. In the meanwhile, if you have questions about the Python part, uh... Right. 
Okay, let's continue with R. Um, as said, for R, there's the kernel currently not installed. Um, but you can just use any R instance that you have. For example, I'm just using my um, R Studio. I think this should be. Um, and I hope that you have, if somebody needs to clone the notebook, uh, Mikhail is going to help you, but I hope you have it available. So it's the notebook that is also in the Cubes and Cloud repository that ends with the RMD, so the R markdown file. And we are now going to do exactly the same steps as Michele has showed you. If you have questions um, to the R client, um, I've put the link here. So there are a lot of vignettes, how to use it, et cetera. There's a lot of nice functionality within it that we don't have the time to go into um, completely. So we have the list of libraries. There's nothing special there besides the Python client. I think the other ones um, are the usual suspects. For connecting is the same thing. So you can connect to this um, backend from anywhere. As Michele just showed it from the Copernicus Dataspace Ecosystem Jupyter Hub, but you can do it also from um, any programming environment um, that you want. And that is what we're doing right now. You only need the URL. So now we're connected. We're not locked in yet. So we have limited functionality so far. Um, we can yeah, check the metadata that is available, but we cannot do processing. We can also build process graphs, but not execute them. So in the next step, we log in. And that is the step where then we can actually um, do the processing. Okay, so the login is successful, as you see. You can also double check um, via the connection object, and you can ask it if you're logged in. Um, then we're loading the catchment data and having a look at it so that you've already seen. Um, and we're going to inspect the metadata. <clears throat> and here the function is so the OpenEO, that is the, the package that is the R client. And here the list collection just shows you which collections are available on this specific backend. So here we have all the Sentinels. If you connect potentially to another OpenEO backend, you will see another list of collections here. So that completely um, just fetches what is available. <clears throat> the same is true. We look now at a specific collection. So we've also, also seen that just in the Python client, it renders the stack metadata nicely and tells you everything that you need to know. And now we're already at the stage where we define a workflow as said. So we extract the bounding box from our SF object, from our spatial object, and we can directly use this bounding box also in the process graph building. So we could specify it as a list, but also the R client, for example, it understands spatial, um, spatial objects, mainly SF objects and bounding box. So can, you can directly use them. It will be translated internally. And maybe another um, small difference to the Python client is that um, with the R client, you have to explicitly um, load the processes that are available on the backend. So different backends can have different processes. And the first thing you do is you load them from the backend into an object that I call P here, and you just call processes. And after that, your object P will um, hold all the processes. So that is why it's taking a time now since it has been communicating with the backend. And now you see the head of the names of the object P, you have all these um, processes. And if you type P and dollar, then you get an auto completion. You can check through what the different um, processes that are available are. Okay, and now we're at the step where we actually want to load data. So that's the first step um, of our process graph. We use the specifications that we have set um, further up, we use the process load collection. So it is always the first thing that you will do because you need a collection that you want to work on. And we can also visualize it, um, the process node that we have just created here. So now we're again on par. Michele will take over. And it's important to say that so far, no processing has been executed. We're just um, building um, our instructions that we want to execute later on. And so, I mm -hmm. If we were working with open data view, at this point, I will not make the Because, you know, I requested the interval, I and this is going to be an interval. That's what I understand. So, what, what do I have now? What is this S2 thing? Um, yeah, um, yeah so, so far, you have nothing actually. That is just a description of what you want to do. 
So you say you want to potentially later use this data, but now you just create um, the recipe for what you will execute in the end. So now you tell them all the extents that you have. You have a whole Sentinel-2 collection, but you want this uh, catchment that we've seen for a certain amount of time. So you specify this in a JSON that is shown here, and that is what is going to be sent to the backend once you click on execute. So what you Yeah, so the, the clients, they help you. Usually this is supposed to be hidden away from the user. So this is actually something that you might not want to see because it's uh, hard to read. So the clients are your native programming language, but they create this process, this JSON representation of um, a workflow that can communicate um, with the backend via the API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, later on, maybe we'll... Ah, sorry. Yes, Jibat. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't because get it. Whatever, Apulia, and I, I need a, a, a data cube as defined by Edza. Uh, which is regular in space and regular in time. And where do I get my data cube now? Uh, that's, that would be before applying the indexes. I would like to make yeah. sure that the it mm -hmm. really is a data cube. Yeah. I mean, uh, there, there are processes in OpenEO that allows you to do that. You can aggregate in time. Uh, so basically, if you have sending your true data, which is coming from different tiles, uh, for example, you could try to aggregate over time and get the weekly average, medium, whatever. Um, and especially, you could decide to align different data sets resampling one to the other. Uh, but those are, I mean, are a bit more advanced processes that we and, might And do. the aggregating time does what, for example, GDAO Cubes does. Gets gets it right in terms of clouds. Gets the best. Gets the best. For example, if I take five images a month and I want, the, you get the the, you, the ones you, with the least cloud. You, you can do that, but you have to be either you have your cloud mask already, or you create your cloud mask and then you define. No, you process. have your cloud mask. You, yes, you actually. Yeah, yeah. Have. You can define a process to do that. No, but you can. I mean, I always can define the process. Mm -hmm. I'm asking, uh, what is available? in your example, because I defining a process also means in open your terms, making sure that the server implements what I define. So I'm asking- No, I mean define, I mean, creating an open your process graph that does what you're saying. So, I mean, are the full functionalities of described in the Apple and Pebesma paper, like in GDAO cubes available, for example? I, I, I don't have an answer. I don't know all the, the functions that you're you mean? No, I mean available in Copernicus. You you have a, a you you give an example of the Copernicus uh, data ecosystem. I'm asking a specific question, not a generic question. Are the functions to build a data cube available in this Copernicus data ecosystem? Because if the question would be in Microsoft, they are not. In Amazon, they are not. And and so are they available? Which mean documentation uh, of sure whom? I mean, what is the questions. where? Where do I find if ah? Where you find the the list of processes that are available? You mean? Okay, I mean to get to know what kind of processes that are available on on a specific backend. After that, you connect it. You can do connection dot list processes processes and you'll get uh, the list of processes that are available in this particular backend. Which are which are also the ones exposed. No, no, the, my, my final question, you have aggregate temporal, and then my question is, is the aggregate temporal equivalent to what is GDO cubes? That's a question. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think we can solve that later in the discussion, but um, I think what you mean, all the processes are generally available to create a dense data cube that has a uh, equally spaced observations. 
and cloud mask and you have the quality filters to use and we will continue maybe it becomes more clear how you can um, apply these processes and i think most of them should be available to do it we can compare later on if it's the same as in gdal cubes okay so we were actually here uh, we defined our first step now we are going to compute the normalized different snow index where we use the green and sweep bands um, you can actually uh, refer uh, to the bands in this way in Python, and uh, you can perform mathematical operations or in uh, in the same way as you would do with NumPy, for example. So just just using subtract and and divide. And this in this case, uh, we have created a reduced dimension process because combining two different bands, uh, we reduce the dimension bands. And for, from two bands, we'll get just a single one, which will be containing the NDSI values. So now that we have uh, a data cube uh, consisting in multiple acquisitions in time with the NDSI values, uh, we can filter it um, with a basic threshold value of 0 0.4. And this will uh, return a Boolean mask that will tell us if uh, that particular pixel uh, is probably containing snow or not. Uh, here we are multiplying by one because this is basically creating a, a Boolean raster and we want to have it as in, um, yeah, in floating point uh, values. This shouldn't be necessary. It's actually a bug of the implementation of uh, the opinion backend of Copernicus. So now that, that we have uh, the snow mask, we want to make sure that the pixels that we selected are actually uh, snow covered pixels. So we want to create a cloud mask that we want to apply. To do that, we are gonna use the scene classification layer um, included in the level three Sentinel 2 collection. Uh, we're gonna use the, so here you have a table with the corresponding values uh, and labels. So uh, number eight is cloud medium probability, nine high probability and three cloud shadows. So we are gonna create a Boolean mask that contains all of them. So as you see, you can use, let's say normal syntax and this is the result. Again, it will be a re reduced dimension process, which includes all the steps that we just defined. Finally, we apply the cloud mask to the snow map, and we say we want to replace the values that will be masked out to the, due to the clouds with, uh, with the number two. So that we'll have, let's say, a classified map with zero for no snow, one for snow, and two for cloud. And this is the output process graph. Uh, finally, just to check out uh, the data that we are gonna work with. Now I comment, commented out the, the line that actually downloads the data because it might take some time. So the NetCDF, it's already included in the repo. And this would be the visualization of a single timestamp. So uh, the 11th of February for our area, and uh, which is already classified with the 0, 1, and 2 labels, and also masked out to the actual catch, um, catchment polygon. Um, okay, maybe just as a quick explanation, Michele went over it quite quickly, but in this step that is commented out right now, when you put the dot download, that is where you actually request the data and the, the processing will start on the backend and you will be forwarded a link to the result that is used here to, to load the data later. Thank you. Uh, you say it's it's processing on the back end. Is that the number of the amount of resources that's being used on the back end? Is that independent from the size of the container we started at the beginning? Mm -hmm. 
So what did you choose a medium size actually? Because we could have gone with a small would have been fine. Small would have been fine, I think. Yeah. So the like the processing is on the notebook that Michele showed is um what you choose is just what you process locally after you requested the data. So if you want to do heavy lifting after you have your data cube loaded, then you might want a larger notebook. But the processing that is happening um on the backend side is completely um decoupled from the notebook that you choose. Okay, so we will also continue um, in R now. So to compute the normalized difference snow index um, in R again, it works a little bit different since it's a little bit closer to the open your syntax, but here you can define a function, for example, that you're going to use later on. Um, so we just call this now NDSI function. We give X, which will be the data cube object S2 that we have um, defined before. And then we remember that we have three bands in this data cube. There was the green band, the 11th band, the sphere band, and the cloud mask. So to get the green band, we index it as we do in R with the square brackets and tell them, so this is going to be my green band, this is going to be my sphere band, and then we just apply um, the formula for the NDSI. So now we've defined the function. Now we're going to actually use the function. And here we're using um, the open EO process, reduce dimension. Um, since we now have a three-dimensional data cube and we want to get rid of the band dimension, we have to reduce this dimension. So we tell it, use this dimension as input to my function and give me a, a new value using these um, values, um, using this the band information. So this is what we're telling it right now. So now the data cube has changed and we don't have a band information anymore. We only have the NDSI values left. And yeah, as a process graph, again, it would look like this. So only one so far, reduce dimension here. And in here, in this process, you will have um, the band mass that we calculated. Then for creating the snow map, we're doing some thresholding. So we're defining the function again, the thresholding function. Um, so now we're inputting the into the process the, the data cube at the stage where we left it. So this NDSI. And we're calling the, it only has one band. And we say larger than um, 0 0.4 is our threshold value. So here we're saying apply because now we're not reducing dimensions. Now we're applying something to a dimension. So we want to keep the dimension, just applying it to every um, value um, of the data cube. And yeah, we apply greater than four. Oops, forgot to execute that. Okay, in your process graph, now you see you have one reduce dimension and then one apply step. Um, now there's uh, another function from the R client that is quite interesting. It's the get sample function because now I try to explain you what is happening to the data cube. And you can imagine if you chain a lot of these processes, you might not keep trace of what is actually happening or happening with your data cube or what is left in the data cube. So there's the get sample function, which um, allows you at any point um, in your workflow to just add a get sample node and it will download um, a subset of the data, a very small one that you can receive quickly. Um, you can inspect if the values that you have produced um, are actually what you're inspect um, what you have expected. So that is what I'm currently doing. I say um, get sample. I give the snow map that I've created so far. And then I say as stars true. So it will directly load the data set as a stars object into my R workspace. And once um, the computing has finished. Um, we will plot it directly and then we check if we have zero and one values, what we actually expect. Let's see how long this takes. I hope it works quickly. So why, why we are waiting here is maybe also interesting. We are um, currently doing a synchronous job. Okay, now we received the time series. Um, okay, so we have the value zero and one is kind of what we expect. Now, if we wanted to inspect it more visually, we could put a background map behind it, but it is actually what we wanted. We have zero and one values, which are snow and no snow. Um, so that is always good to do. I advise you strongly to do this sometimes in your process graph. Now, Michele also has for the Python client an idea of how to do that. He can explain later in the discussion. Um, and we continue with the masking function. So it's again, um, the same idea, but now we're again, creating a cloud mask. So we're starting again from this original Sentinel-2 input and we're creating this cloud mask using the scene classification.
So actually we're creating now a second branch of the data cube that is a mask. And here we are, yeah, we would get the sample again. I'm not going to do it so, the, so that we don't have to wait. But as said, what would happen is that we call um, the backend and tell them download this data. So it takes a while and it blocks your console. And this is good for small requests, but if you have bigger requests, um, you should um, create a batch job and we will show you for the final result how to do a batch job. So that's just something to keep in mind that there are synchronous calls and asynchronous processing calls. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're applying um, this snow mask. So we have here the, the function mask, the open your process mask. And you see you have the input. Um, we have two different inputs now. So one, the data is the snow map. We want to mask it. And the other one is the mask we have just created. That is a binary mask um, yeah. with uh, true and false values. And it's going to be applied to um, the NDSI cube. And here you see these are the two branches that I meant. Out of the Sentinel-1 cube, we are creating um, the NDSI down here and the mask up here. And then we are um, applying the mask function and merging them back together. Okay, and here we would um, now get one time slice um, of the data. So we say filter temporal, um, give the time extents that we want to use. Um, we create a bounding box. Now I've enlarged it a bit so that we can see something. And then again, we call the get sample function. I will run it, this will take some time, um, but I think Michele can um, continue in the meanwhile and later we will have a look at the result. Okay. Um, so basically what we built right uh, until this point is a data cube where we have for each time step a classified scene with clouds uh, snow and non-snow and now we want to compute statistics over over each time step and get a single value or multiple values uh, from our data cube and not the the full uh, the full data cube so what we want to get um, are uh, cloud percentage for the catchment for each time step and also the snow cover uh, percentage within the catchment so how we do that? Um, so we basically, for the region, which is defined by the polygon, we create a Boolean mask for each of those things that we want to count. So for example, for the clouds, we already have a Boolean mask that says ones uh, are the cloudy pixels and zero are the not, not cloudy pixels. And if you think about it, if you have this uh this matrix this array if you just count the the ones so if you basically sum all the values you will get the number of pixels that that are uh, marked as clouds for the the polygon for the catchment that we defined and the same for uh, the snow covered pixels and also so since we want to compute a percentage given the, the snow cover pixels and the cloud cover pixels, we also want to get the overall uh, number of valid pixels. So that's the first thing that we are doing right now. Uh, basically with this step, snow map cloud three greater than minus one, I'm basically creating a Boolean mask that is set to one uh, everywhere, just to count the number of pixels that are available. And then I specify add dimension because this step here gets translated into this uh, reduced dimension process. Uh, but if later on we want to create a single data cube with multiple bands containing our different masks that will be used to, to create this value to, to count the pixels, we also have to reassign a name to these band dimensions. So, uh, and the way to do that, um, in, in OpenEO is using the add dimension process. Uh, we give the name to our dimension, the type. The type could be bands, temporal, uh, or spatial. 
and the actual label. So as I was saying, we do the same uh, for the cloud mask. Uh, the Boolean cloud mask has been already computed, so we have it here already. Um, so we just add the dimension and we do the same for the snow map. So for the snow cover pixels. Finally, now that we have three different data cubes with three uh, bands, we can merge them all together with the merge cubes process. And um, basically you have a single data cube with three different bands. One will be called N catchment, one and cloud and one and snow. Um, and finally, the, the last step, which is the most important here, we use the aggregate spatial process. Aggregate spatial basically performs a spatial aggregation given uh, either one or a set of geometries. In our, in our case, we just have a single polygon, which is defined by the, the GeoJSON that we already uh, loaded before. And uh, we also need to specify a reducer function, which is the function that will be applied to all those pixels that will be selected by uh, the, the polygon that we, we uh, loaded before. So, and this will be the final uh, process graph with all the steps that we defined with the, all the add dimensions, merge cubes, and finally aggregate spatial. And as Peter was saying, so with the get sample function on, on, our, on the R side, we are using a synchronous call. So we just send the process graph to the backend and we ask, please run it immediately and give me back the data as soon as possible. Uh, but if the process gets large, you cannot do that because after a while, this uh, call would be just killed. So instead, we should use batch jobs, which are asynchronous uh, calls. So it, it's asynchronous processing where you basically send the process graph to the backend. It gets stored in a, in a database. It will be uh, put in a queue. Then uh, it will be running and so on. And finally, once the result will be ready, you'll be able to download it. So the final step uh, before sending our process graph is to use the save result process where we, we pass the data format that we want to use as uh, for our result. And then we use create job given a title and start job. Uh, as file format, uh, it could be also an SCTF, GeoTIFFS, uh, COGS, or, I mean, COGS. Hmm? Yes. Um, to check the available file formats, Peter. Should I show the available file formats? Um, with connection dot file formats. No. Let's see with the autocomplete function. List file formats. You get the supported file formats. And here you also see if they're supported as export like GeoTIFF or import like uh, GeoJSON. So now we created our bed job uh, and we can check what's the status. Uh, here you can get a overview of your job. Uh, the job ID is a unique identifier of the job. Here you can check, see um, some details. And but the, the most important, I would say, is the status. Now it, it's created, so it's not yet started. Uh, and if you rerun the cell, uh, another request will be sent and you'll get uh, update information. Now it's running and in some time it will be marked as finished. Okay, so while we wait for Michele's um, results, we can go back to the um, R client. So here you see that the synchronous call um, has finished and we can have a look um, at the object. And you see, since I said get sample, that's just the, the bounding box that I asked for. And you can see here, yes, it's a binary mask that has a one um, as the snow values and zero as the non-snow values. So we're fine with that. Yeah, and you could also 
just check what is in the data cube. If you hit raster down here, you see, yeah, it's a data cube with 103 pixels. Since it's smaller, it's got one time step that we asked for. And here you see the value. So it's zeros and ones. So all is as expected. Okay, we'll do the same thing in calculating um, catchment statistics. Um, I think Michele has explained the concept well. We're creating three binary masks. Um, then we're merging them together into one cube. So we have three stacks. Then we're applying the, um, the catchment to it. And we're taking the sum of all the zero and one um, pixels. So you see here, we're using the merge cubes processes. As said before, we're inputting, um, again, the last steps of our processings. We can also visualize that. Again, you see in process graph is growing. And finally, um, we could again get a sample if we want to, but I think we've done that enough. I think now we can also actually create the job. And it's the same thing. We have to add the last um, node of our process graph should always be save result, asking for the format. So we can also, um, with the Python, uh, our client, we can also get um, the formats. So open EO, list file formats is the same thing because so now it's in a list, but you will have all the file formats that you can actually use listed here because you will not probably not know it by yourself. So that is something that you um, interact with the back end again. Okay, and then you also create this job. You call the function create job. You give the um, last version of your data cube as input, you create a title, and then you say start job, then you can list the jobs and you will um, get information on it. And finally, you say, once this is done, you will say um, download results. And then you will get the path and you can load the data. Okay, so now we're told, um, yeah, the job has been successfully registered. Um, on the back end, and I call to start the job now. Okay, we have seen um, also that we got this job ID that Michele just showed before, um, now a new one for my job, um, and it has been queued for evaluation, so that means it's been put into the processing um, queue, and now we could ping continuously um, the status of the job. So let's see, we're using um, the ID that we get job um, dollar ID will give us exactly that ID that we see down there. And we're inputting it into the list um, jobs function and are requesting only that one job. And here we see um, it is created um, when it has been updated and the status is queued. So we're currently still waiting for it to start processing. So now we're thinking the same step again and Michele you can continue. So let's see if my job finished. No, still running. Doesn't matter. Uh or it does. Yeah, but probably I'm not sure if I have the data here. Probably ah yes. Okay. Let's see. So basically um if you would run job dot sorry, where is it? Job dot status, you would get directly the the status of the job running. So basically, you can check if it's marked as finished and then try to download the files. Uh, since we don't want to wait, I think it takes around five minutes to be completed. We already have the data uh, available here. And uh, I can load the the JSON time series that has been returned from, from the backend. I can load them as a dictionary here. Uh, be careful, uh, the JSON file format doesn't specify, uh, I mean, the, the, ver the variables that are in a JSON doesn't have to be in order. So in fact, here they're not sorted. Uh, so you'll have to do it by yourself later. So just check part of your data before doing something with it. Um, we just create a pandas data frame that will contain the number of 
pixels, valid pixels uh, for each acquisition, the number of cloudy pixels and the number of snowy pixels. Now that we have those values, we can actually compute the cloud percentage. So just the number of cloud values uh, divided by the number of uh, valid values. We can add it to the data frame here. And we can start uh, plotting the cloud percentage for each uh, acquisition and also a threshold value that we will apply. So if the cloud coverage is greater than 25%, we will discard this data. So basically only those values that are here below will remain. Then we can do the same to compute the snow percentage over the catchment. We can uh, plot the unfiltered uh, snow percentage. You may see that the time series is a bit noisy because it still contains the, the cloudy scenes. And finally, we can filter given the threshold value. value. So we discard all the pixels that have greater than 25% um, cloud coverage. And finally, uh, we can compare um, the snow coverage that we see here. So we see that at the beginning, we are in February, uh, we have a high uh, snow coverage over the, the catchment and it, it is slowly decreasing with the spring season until, yeah, until the end of spring. And we want to see if how this reflects or uh, relates with the um, discharge values of, uh, don't know which river it is, but yeah, the river at the station. Uh, we have a CSV file that contains these values. We can open it and finally plot uh, all the values together. So in orange, we have the snow, uh, snow um, cover percentage, which is reflected on this axis and the discharge values that are on the left axis. And we can see how, uh, yeah, when the snow starts to smell, the, the discharge values are increasing. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go through um, the final steps of this um, workflow now also in the R client. I should check the status of my job, but I will also load it. We can later in the discussion, um, we can we will show you where the status of the jobs are. So I'm loading the time series as well, um, doing some data crunching. I said, um, maybe an important thing here, Michele showed it before, and the the raw format of the file is interesting because you get a a JSON file and you have these values here. Um, so as said, for every time step, we get three values since we had three bands. And the first one is the total number of pixels. The second one um, is the number of cloud pixels and the third one, the number of snow pixels. So that reflects um, the order that you have given to in the data cube. So that is the order of the bands in the data cube. Okay, now we're adding um, the filters as set. So this is now local R computing. You can do that in whichever way you want. That is just to show you the result in the end. Um, here we're listing the cloud filter and also a catchment filter because there are actually two tiles. That is maybe also interesting. In this catchment, we have two Sentinel, two tiles. So the northern part is one and the southern part is one. And if you look at the number of pixels, then you see that they have um, different amounts. So you could potentially filter out um, according to that. Um, number of pixels as well. And then we can use the filters and plot the data here. There's the 25% threshold for the clouds. We can plot the unfiltered time series and see that it's um, yeah, too noisy. And we can remove the cloud observations. See, we have the exact same value as um, Michele created. So this also shows you that the JSON process draft that we're doing is the same thing. 
just um, created once uh, using the Python client and once using the R client. And we can also compare it to the station discharge data. Now, this is a data set that we have already placed in the um, repository, but that's also online available from the Clear Snow project. So it could have theoretically also been fetched online. And here you see the same relationship of the snow melting process that feeds into the river for the discharge. Um, so that's it. That it was um, your first uh, whole open EO process that you have uh, completed, hopefully. Um, maybe I can ask you to raise the hands if it has worked for, for you. Okay, so you followed all the steps. That's good. So that's, um, yeah, it's, it's not a very scientific example, but at least it shows you all the steps that you could potentially do using um, OpenEO. And I think you can take it from there, um, build your own process graphs, um, use the documentations. They are plentiful available. Um, and now I think we'll move on to the, uh, we have a question. In order to do the process, well, first of all, uh, congratulations uh, for a very nice example, very well explained. And I think this is easy to follow. So lots of work to build a simple example. Now, uh, a question regarding the fact that to do a lot of what you do, you had to create a new image with the new index, the NDSI. Now that, of course, it happened on the back end. So what happens uh, to the back end if I'm taking a huge area, say Italy, the whole Italy, for example, or the whole Brazil to, to get at home, or Amazonia, which is bigger than Europe, and I want to create an NDVI out of Sentinel data. So now, I'm going to ask NDVI, the Sentinel bands are there. So what happens? Who controls the fact that this data set, this new image is written somewhere? Because Google Earth Engine, for example, writes this on your own space, if I'm not mistaken. And therefore you have your own space there, but I didn't see the concept of your own space where you store the NDSI. Does it get computed every time? Is it the way, how, how do you, what happens when you create new bands, new indexes or derived indexes uh, out of OpenEO? Um, so along with the, the job details, uh, there will be also the, the results stored and it will be only the final results. So not the interme intermediate steps. So just the final result. Final results is fine, but yeah. remember that if I'm doing a study over Italy, I may no, no, no. need yeah, to no, calculate, no, uh, do that, various but... studies using NDVI or NDWI, mm -hmm. and would I have to compute the NDWI every job that I'm making? Don't I save it for a future work? Mm -hmm. um, currently, uh, the job results are stored as a um, stack asset, and they could ideally could, uh, they could be reused later on. There's a process called uh, load stack that allows you to um, to basically use uh, either public available uh, stack uh, data through stack collections, or also reload the data that you just computed with your. So what, where where is my? I mean. Um just to, to make the connection with Google Earth Engine. Where is my workspace? Okay. In the whole... The, in the, the workspace uh, thing is something that uh, is uh, work in progress. Currently, as a workspace, you have your list of jobs with the results, and that's it. But it's something that they're uh, trying to implement. It's not yet ready. Um, yeah, so they're stored on the back end, Gilberto. And what you get as a user is the link to that file but it is stored on the backend currently. And you can use, you see, you have the list of jobs and you have all the IDs of what you have created. And if you want to get that file again and continue working with it, you don't have to recalculate it. You just say, download me my job ID, and then you will get the result. And that is your personal, that is your personal workspace, so to say. It's just not a folder that you see per se. You just see the list of jobs and they have a address to them. 
Uh, yep, just keeping the same talk for topic. So first, uh, thank you for uh, preparing and this example. And I think it was really nice to push to use the Copernicus data space ecosystem so we could see like working practices. So definitely we should have more like uh, tutorials and workshops like that. So, and about this thing, like to save the output. So as Gilberto was asking, Google Earth Engine basically has two modes of operate. And and, and the first one, it's, it's completely on the fly. So it, when you send the job to compute, Earth Engine all, also has this option, right? You can save and you specify where it will be saved. But if you don't do that and you just try to plot, it computes on the fly. So, and this is a kind of, it's really difficult to implement. Uh, so they, they did really good, but it's basically these two options. So every time that you, so you can build the whole workflow and it will be executed only if you plot or if you start a job. So, and when you plot, of course, you can do some analysis on the fly and that's a very nice concept. So as far as I understood in the open you you only have the option to save the job. You don't have a kind of on the fly processing of the pipeline to visualize like uh, we, we actually do have uh, uh, basically you could create uh, a bad job and then uh, don't remember the name of it but it's like create map service where you basically see uh, your process being applied on the fly to I mean you can basically scroll around it's implemented by Sentinel Hub in Open Your Platform so it's not available here I guess but uh, yeah, I don't have any example okay. here. Yeah, I know. No, yeah, because uh, so if you need to save all the outputs, it's really difficult to scale yeah, if you think yeah, about yeah. it, right? And even like if it's the last step. So and maybe like, for example, you should do like an analysis for a whole country. You need to save every individual output yeah. and uh, even I the actually, last one, right? That's. Um, I will show you one thing before the web editor. Um, if you go to the list of notebooks that are here on the left side, you will find one which is called uh, Data Processing Stack. Uh, this notebook is an example of the OpenEO client side processing, which has been implemented recently. So the idea was, so it's quite complicated to create a process graph and uh, debug or prototype on the cloud because you have to run it, you have to get the results and inspect it. So the idea is, uh, what if we allow the user to um, prototype locally with the same open your proce uh, processes definition? And then once they, they are pretty sure that what's, uh, get, uh, what, what they're getting is actually what they want, they can move the process graph to the cloud. So, well, uh, I'm going to miss um, skip the installation part of some libraries. Uh, it's already uh, released, but there are some processes that have not been merged yet. So I'm installing the development versions here. But basically, the idea is that we can use. Oh no, no, I have to install everything. Okay. Um, the idea is that we can use publicly available uh, data through stack catalogs, and we can get the results on the fly via X-ray because I will show you uh, this functionality leverages the implementation of open your Python processes. Uh, they live inside the repository called open your processes task uh, here. And basically what it's doing, so we define the, um, the, the open your process graph as we did before. And then it gets translated into um, Python calls to the Python implementation of those processes. Um, the Copernicus data space is not using this implementation. Uh, the UDC backend and our backend is using uh, this implementation of the processes. So basically, if you run your process graph locally and then you put it on the cloud, uh, which doesn't rely on the same process implementation, then you might get some uh, different result. But it's still, you shouldn't, but I mean, the data will be different. So if the data is different, you might already get something different. Uh, yeah, it's still installing. 
in the meantime, I can, um, if you go to, sorry, uh, if we jump around like this, but we don't have so much time left. Uh, another way to explore Opinio, it's uh, the Opinio web editor, which is a graphical interface. And if you go to opinio.dataspace.copernicus.eu, uh, there will be the um, Opinio web editor opening up. And if you don't log in, you get the same information that we were getting on the various clients. So the collections that are available, the processes, in the collection, you can even uh, get a preview of the collections. So like a WMS service. In fact, it's a W, oh, you have to zoom in. Yeah, anyway, it was just to explore the data which is available. And again, you would have to log in to uh, process something or get the, the list of jobs that you have run or created in the same way uh, as we have seen on, in Python or R. And uh, here you could inspect the result. You would see how many credits you have been using for this particular job, CPU usage, number of pixels, multiple useful statistics and then the result file with all the metadata and finally it's quite interesting you will also see also the list of central true tiles that has been used as input to to get your final result so it's quite nice to to verify the provenance of your of your result uh, and here you could download your results. Basically, if you click here, you get your JSON file, or you can even visualize it. In this case, it doesn't make so much sense because those values have not been scaled. So those are not the percentage, but if we would compute directly in OpenEO the percentage values, we could also directly see the time series uh, popping up here in the web editor. Uh, before the questions, let me go back here and see. Yes, it started too I'm fast. Actually, I, no, I think yes. One more thing that is maybe interesting uh, yeah. to say for the ah, yes, users the, uh, that are still language, uh, new. Yeah. yeah so two things. So it is important to see. So this is my account now. I'm logged in as Peter Selner, and you see these jobs. These are the jobs that we have just created with the R client. So that are these are exactly the jobs that we have just created. So Gilberto, that is probably your question. You see what you have done here, and you can always download them here. So that is just a graphical um, interface of what we have been doing. And if you look at the um, the process graph of what we're doing, that is exactly what we have created with the R client, and you can find it here. And if you get the results, so what Michele just shown this information button. This is maybe interesting for reproducible science in these things. On the one hand, you see the credits that you've used. So with Copernicus, you get thousands for free, I think per month. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, whoever knows that, but you can do some stuff. You see how long the process graph took. You have the whole process graph. So if you share your result, it will be reproducible um, by this nature. So it's already there, you share it with the data. And you can also uh, look at the process graph as a JSON. Um, yeah, here's the download link. Mm -hmm. Yes, just a second. Mm -hmm. show yeah. And one more, yeah, that is what we wanted to show as well. So as said, here is um the process graph in the JSON or graphical format. And I think if you go to do you remember where it was? No, it was up it's here. Part, maybe this D D button. D. Uh, no. So what we're looking for currently, I cannot remember the yeah, the name. Yes. Okay, so you see here, this is the process graph we have created. And you could also create this via drag and drop. We can show that in a second. And if you have created it, because maybe you're not so experienced, it's probably the best way to start with the web editor. Just drag your collection in there, do the connections by hand. And then you can click on export into another programming language. And here you would have this. 
um, reverse engineered into the different uh, client processing languages. So here, JavaScript, you can also go to, to Python. And you see, this will be um, the same thing that we have created in the Python notebook here. And you can also um, translate it into R. It might look a little bit different since it's a translation done from the process graph, but it's a really good starting point. So that's like the, the whole round trip that we gave to you now. And I think that are some yeah, really helpful tools that you can also get from the web editor. Yeah, of course, there are multiple ways of defining the same process graph for to get the same result. So the translation, uh, of course, will not be exactly the same of what we did on the client side. Uh, so quickly, I wanted to show this client-side processing functionality. So in this case, we are not going to connect to any backend. So we're just going to use the processing power of, of the local Jupyter instance. Uh, we're going to use Sentinel True Level 2A collection from the planetary computer, Microsoft. And we basically do the same thing that we did before. Instead of a, co a connection, now we have a local connection because basically we're just working locally. And we use, uh, well, in this case, since I wanted to be a bit more efficient, I know that those two bands uh, have a resolution of 20 meters and this one 10 meters. I'm not going to load them all together. Otherwise, they would be uh, resampled on the fly to 10 meters. Uh, so I'm, load, I'm loading uh, them separately and then merging them. Additionally, I also know that uh, my catchment is mostly on the uh, Sentinel True Tile 32 TPS. So I'm just going to uh, load data from that tile. Uh, again, instead of load collection, since now we don't have collections, but we have uh, a stack catalog, we are going to use this load stack process. And just to show you directly uh, what it means uh, this connection with the Python implementation. If now this object, which is basically the, the process graph, if I call dot execute, it will basically uh, translates, translate this process graph into uh, the Python implementation, uh, load the stack data. Currently it's just the metadata. Uh, so basically nothing has been downloaded apart from the metadata. You could see how much data you would actually need to download if you're using the wall of it and all the other uh, metadata information about what you're going to use here. Um, hmm. So I proceed creating another data cube. This one is in the 10 meters. Now there's a section which is commented out, but you could download uh, these input data as NetCDFs to, uh, to be used later on if you want, but now we're gonna do everything on the fly. We want to resample the 10 meter band to uh, the 21, and we use this open new process, which is called resample cube spatial. The target is the 20 meter data cube, and we use average, and we finally, we should close. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, you could go through the notebook, uh, it should work, and you should see more or less the same result. Yeah, I think the most important thing that is still to see from that point on, you just continue with OpenEO syntax, and you will create the whole thing locally. So if you want to compare what you have done from a platform um, with data where you know the provenance of, or you want to really go into the time series, etc., that is the way to go to compute the same thing with the same process graph uh, locally. So you have full control over what you're doing, and you can validate what is there? And now the floor is open for some more questions. And anyway, we can remain some more minutes after the finish, if there are questions. Yeah, it might be a bit overwhelming with so many information coming. <laughs> Take some time to digest all of it. Yeah, I can kick off a little. I was in the workshop with uh, with Leandro, which which is basically you know the uh, the complement of this, right? So we see two approaches, and here you 
basically work on, on, on image collections and on things you want to do with them without seeing what is going to happen, who does, where the files are, who is going to go through them or, or paralyzing things or not, or managing infrastructure and stuff and giving you priority on the cloud and sharing. And, and so things happen, uh, the things you would, you would uh, expect. And, um, I can only say that, you know, I, I spent a lot of uh, sweat and tears uh, on this last seven years and, and many other people. They, I mean, every, all the other people did the actual work, of course. Um, and uh, it, it was it was a lot of work uh, and worth it. And, and I think we are halfway or so. Right. So this is really sort of work in progress. So it is really fantastic to see this now as one of the two processing APIs on the Copernicus data space. A thing, so it's there next to the Sentinel Hub, which is closed source, which is of, of course also fantastic, but it's closed source, right? So that is that is you know has its problems for for open science purposes, um, and 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 we have to see how the you know there's a many challenges here, but we have to see how this this is progressing and and being picked up by the by the community. I was looking because in the initially we didn't really explain um, what OpenEO is actually for, other than doing these processing jobs. But I was looking for uh, animated content that we had created um, for the for this MOOC, which is anyway. If you want to learn about this stuff, um, you can also go to this uh, GitHub Cubes and Clouds repository and look through the lectures that are there, and you will surely find a lot of things to learn. And I think, Mikili, where was it? Was it in the data access one? The the slider for open EO? Uh, anyway, another good source uh, for information for open EO is the official documentation, which mm -hmm. contains uh, some good explanations of all, uh, almost, let's say, all the processes. If you go to openio.org and uh, under data cubes, there are some good introductions to the data cube concept and also uh, filtering processes, reduced dimension processes, apply processes, even explained uh, graphically so that you can really get to understand what's going on when you apply this kind of uh, process to your, your data cube. Yeah, and as said, open your org, you find all the documentation of all the processes in the different um, clients. You will find getting started guides. Um, you will find the original definition of the processes as well, if you're interested in that, how you could implement them yourself. And yeah, as said, so here example for the R client, there are already five or six vignettes that really explain you in detail um, how the R client works and how you can use it to the maximum. And for the Python client, there's for sure the same. So there's a lot of information um, out there. And yeah, I think we're done on point. And if you have any questions also later on throughout the conference, um, feel free to ask. Mm -hmm.